WrestleMania. Welcome to WrestleMania 39 Part 2, where we apparently continue the tradition of the second night failing to be as fun or as eventful as the first night. When you look back at WrestleMania since 2020, it always seems like the first night steals the show while the second night falls flat on its face. After all these years, I'm actually convinced that whoever's carrying the I'm Home sign is a planted fan by WWE itself since I see it at literally every stadium pay-per-view nowadays. Second night of WrestleMania at the SoFi Stadium, and also the second Sins video where I'm telling you that the stadium screen up there continues to malfunction at several points throughout the event. Boy, that's gotta set a record. The Champ Returned. Wait, what? Since when did John Cena get scheduled for another match in WrestleMania 39? Is that the next impromptu match with The Miz? Oh god. The coldest cold open. And now Kevin Hart's presence in the WrestleMania intro makes a lot more sense given it was still extremely cold outside in Hollywood. And as I said in part one, we should have moved it to April 8th to 9th because the weather was clearly trolling us all. Better believe they're going to want a sequel. Yes, we would love a sequel, but what we meant by wanting a sequel was a higher success like Shrek 2, not a fail like Shrek 3. The Miz continues to be a dick to Snoop Dogg. I bet he told the audio technicians to play his music during Snoop's introduction so that he could get all the glory. Also, after Snoop Dogg literally made The Miz compete against Pat McAfee last night, how is Miz even comfortable standing next to him in the ring tonight? Three titles are on the line! Technically, four titles are on the line. Yeah, yeah, Roman Reigns is the undisputed Universal Champion, but until one of those titles no longer exists, it's a fake unification, and Roman in reality is a double world champion defending two belts for the price of one. That's a fact. Fire it up! Another night of Snoop Dogg teasing opening pyrotechnics to get fired in the stadium. Another night of disappointment because it's too fucking bright outside. Long neck Josh, why did you yell pyro pyro get your camera out to me on two separate occasions? I know that WrestleMania 39 has a long ramp to the ring, but it takes four freaking minutes before Omos has made his way to the ring. Holy crap, that's about the entire length of the match he's competing in. Also, I'm not one to sit in confusion, but it just feels funny and weird that Brock Lesnar went from the main event of last year's WrestleMania to crown a double world champion, to flipping the ring with a tractor, to feuding with Bobby Lashley, to facing Omos at WrestleMania 39. Don't you think that's a little awkward to think about? Maybe the reason it takes Omos forever to make his way to the ring is because his hood is literally covering his face and he can't see shit. Translation, haha, it sucks to be the Americans to our left because they got their table destroyed last night and we rebuilt ours. And then the other one says, don't jinx us, we could very well be next tonight. Tail of the tape being placed on the screen likely because Omos is still only halfway down the ramp to the ring and we need to keep you entertained somehow before you fall asleep from boredom. If we could do this for Brock Lesnar, then we sure as hell could activate the pyro during the introduction of WrestleMania 39 literally five minutes ago. That sign on the very right over there that says, I sold my heart for tickets. If that's the case, how the hell were you even there in the stadium? Did you turn into Davy Jones and put your heart in the chest? I'm gonna call Captain Jack Sparrow for a moment. Hello, this is Captain Jack Sparrow. I am currently owning Amber Heard stands on Twitter, so please leave a message. Damn it! Oh gosh, are you kidding me? You're actually surprised that Omos can do this to Brock Lesnar? It's not like he hasn't done something like that to Bobby Lashley or anything. Like a child is Omos. Wait, what? I thought Brock Lesnar was the one looking like a child in this match. Now Michael Cole is saying Omos is like a child? Did they suddenly switch sizes or something? You know what? I don't even want to know. We have never seen Lesnar dominated like this. Uh, what about the time he was dominated in 90 seconds by Goldberg six and a half years ago? Did you just forget about that? This is such a different Omos when he first got the scene here. That may be because he had a different name and it was an enforcer for Akira Tozawa's ninjas. After that, he was a security guard for Shane McMahon's failure of an underground show. This part by Omos. Somewhat of an impressive choke slam. however, Brock Lesnar clearly jumped in the air before Omos could even lift him up, so Brock just gave himself a choke slam in this exchange. Omos could have easily stopped himself from hitting the ring post because Brock moved a little early. First Brock gave himself a choke slam, and now Omos threw his own face into the ring post. I suppose we're even now, right? Removing a sin for the way Brock Lesnar sold his lower back. If it were too easy to hit an F5 on Omos, I don't think the moment when it does happen would be as good. This made Brock realize he had to dig deeper into his strength to be able to lift up Omos later on. Can he deliver it? He does! And there we have it, the big spectacle of Brock Lesnar successfully hitting an F5 on the Nigerian giant Omos. The match was the length we expected it to be, and the quality was done very well. I had a great time watching this. Uh, Brock? You, uh, you might want to consider breathing. You're literally turning into a purple grape here. 
second night where we have a WrestleMania showcase match, and I'll add in five sins this time because it absolutely doesn't make sense that any of these women's teams had to qualify, meanwhile the four teams in the men's match were just randomly selected. It's the dead tag team division that had to qualify. Also, wasn't Liv Morgan in some sort of tag team with Tegan Knox, and wasn't Raquel Rodriguez in some sort of tag team with Shotzi? All recently too. How inconsistent of this division. Raquel, they knocked off Tegan Knox and Emma to get here. Tegan Knox and Emma? I thought Emma was in some relationship with Mad Cat Moss. Now she's teaming with Tegan Knox? Is that still a thing right now? Probably not. Speaking of random tag teams, wasn't Tegan Knox also teaming with Natalia for a bit on the road to WrestleMania? And how many random partners is Natalia gonna have in her career? Beth Phoenix, Tamina, Shayna Baszler, Tegan Knox, and now Shotzi? This entire women's tag team division deserves a hundred sins just for existing now that I've owned practically all of them. Also, Shotzi always drives around in her signature tank, but the one time where it could look badass on the grandest stage of them all, no tank in sight. Bummer. Could've at least made a badass entrance for such a pointless team in a pointless match. They knocked off Zia Lee and Lacey Evans. When the hell did Lacey Evans and Zia Lee become a thing? And are they still a thing right now? Probably not. The winner of this matchup could be aligned for a tag team title. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, do I have some disappointing news for you, Michael Cole. Hard to believe this would ever be the case, but Ronda Rousey used to be a huge deal for the women's division, and if this showcase match never existed, Ronda wouldn't have even been on the card for WrestleMania. That just goes to show how much of a huge downgrade even the most famous of women's athletes can get to in WWE. Also, the three teams already in the ring had to qualify for their spot at WrestleMania. Meanwhile, Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler easily waltzed in like tra-la-la, it was already stupid that everyone had to qualify, but at least have this team do the same thing unless... Unless there was literally no other women's teams that they qualified by circumstance. Here in WWE. Oh! We're not even 30 seconds into the showcase match and there's already a terrible botch where Sonya Deville had the worst time impossible to be caught in the code breaker. Well, that's a rare sight to see on the WWE sins. Perhaps I should rephrase from no one cares what's trending to no one cares who's trending. Also, by the time this advertising of Brock being the number one trend went out, Brock Lesnar himself most likely has already left the stadium. Natalia tells Raquel Rodriguez to back off by holding up her hand and... Wait, Raquel actually listened? Bruh, she's one of your opponents. Why are you stopping? She's been in these environments. Natalia tags in Chelsea Green, thus preventing her team's chances of winning the showcase match, even though a member of each team should be legal at once. Stop. Missile drop kick. It's a good thing that Raquel instantly went into defense mode on that because Chelsea would have never actually connected that drop kick correctly based off the way she was landing. In her first WrestleMania. That has got to be the softest slam I have ever seen. And what a shame too because Shotzi had some great athleticism here. Last night's showcase blew me away while this one can just blow me. Breaking things up. Shayna Baszler teases tagging in Ronda Rousey then proceeds to throw Shotzi out of the ring so that Ronda can do anything but tag herself in. The fuck? Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey was injured heading into this match, so it's understandable you want to keep her protected long enough to complete the match, but having her do stuff like this is not making the people any more entertained. Oh, and a Missed opportunity to have Raquel toss Shayna out of the ring into Ronda and Shotzi, but instead, we get a shield powerbomb because why the fuck not? Station. Oh. Sonya Deville and Chelsea Green conveniently attacked the rest of the wrestlers in the ring so that Ronda Rousey didn't have to jump in herself. My god, what are we even doing here? Shotzi ends up spending so much time on the top rope that she can't even hide her frustration since neither Chelsea nor Sonya turns around for like 15 seconds. Raquel had to make sure that Ronda Rousey was out of sight before throwing Liv Morgan into the crowd. Oh! Smart move by Sonya Deville to kick Raquel Rodriguez, however, it also caused Chelsea Green to mess up her DDT attempt. Can we just show an entire replay of the men's showcase match and call it a day? More premature celebrations and I'm so irritated right now. How much longer is this whole thing going to last? Bit premature to celebrate. Corey Graves, as always, would be great at CinemaSins 2 expansion. We've seen premature celebration after premature celebration. Ow. Natalia has a chance to slam Chelsea Green onto Sonya Deville, but make sure to hit it as soft as possible without even trying to look good. Natalia locks in a double sharpshooter at WrestleMania cliche. Since she's been in endless tag team matches most of the time, what did you expect? Liv Morgan's no longer- Ronda Rousey gets tagged in just to deliver the final blow to win the match. That's all I need to say about that. Locked in, Chelsea taps out. I'm honestly going to throw in 10 sins for the absolute waste of time the women's WrestleMania showcase tag team match was. Compared to the men's tag match, this one was sloppy on so many levels. Also, if Ronda Rousey was injured and they kept her protected long enough for her to get the submission victory, why not just have her team lose? 
Hell, Liv Morgan and Raquel Rodriguez are the ones who end up winning the women's tag team titles later down the line anyway, so they're the team who really should have won here. What a mess. Also, also, there are only six matches scheduled for tonight, and two of them were done in the first 30 minutes, and we still gotta fill up three and a half more hours of time. Good luck with that. Bobby Lashley has tweeted for weeks that he was going to do some open challenge at some point during WrestleMania 39, and all he does is appear on the second night to pose with the Andre the Giant Battle Royal trophy, and that's it. That's literally it. We totally had time for this open challenge since there's four matches left and three and a half hours to kill. What is the point of Bobby Lashley walking down the ramp since all he does is pose on the stage with his trophy? Teasing a potential match and then nope. Just by seeing this orchestra at the start of the Intercontinental Championship promo video, you just know you're in for the match of the night. Let's take off a sin right now. Titus O'Neil was probably offered to commentate the women's WrestleMania showcase match, but instantly knew that it would suck, so he chose this one instead. Smart move. Let's take a look at what happens. We already saw a promo package hyping up this Intercontinental Championship match and the feud between Drew McIntyre and Sheamus. We don't need to see yet another one. Can we just go back to the days where I would yell skip to the advertisement of a match? Life was so much simpler then. Those swords almost killed me. Oh great, now the name graphics have the advertisement on the match. Guess that means the barricades will be surrounded by it and a dude in a lemon costume will be present at ringside. Cameras made sure to stay as far away from the stage as possible because the brawling brutes can all be seen due to the sunlight. Boy, remember when Bray Wyatt had to do his lantern entrance in the afternoon sun that one time? Tonight is brought to you by- Holy shit, you already advertised this several times during Drew McIntyre's entrance. CGI graphics and all. Imperium normally are in sync with the head turns, but Giovanni Vinci was late in this exchange to Ludwig Kaiser's turn. I gotta say, Gunther's old school style entrance was done perfectly and got me hyped for this epic fight we are about to witness. Let's freaking go. Gunther's upset for making this triple threat match. Gunther is upset at this match being a triple threat despite the fact that he and Imperium ruined Sheamus and Drew McIntyre's number one contenders match. The way they were acting, Gunther practically didn't want to compete at WrestleMania whatsoever, which is strange if you ask me. Gunther tries to be that asshole who convinces his two challengers to fight while he picks up the pieces. For a guy who claims the mat is sacred, Gunther is acting less than protective of his craft. Hey, Gunther's saying, what a troll! Drew McIntyre hits a Claymore kick on Gunther that doesn't even connect with him properly. Whoops, bad start. Champ, turn my attention to shame. Wait a minute, did Drew McIntyre just point to a non-existent WrestleMania sign? Bruh, we're not in the pointing season anymore. We're literally at WrestleMania. He's trying, listen to him, right. listen to him. Uh, Titus, Drew McIntyre is not exactly connecting any chops right now, so what are we supposed to be listening to? Tell us about the chops though, Titus. Good idea, or, or, and hear me out on this one, what if we talked about what's currently going on in the ring right now? That sounds uncharted, am I right? Hey, call the police, 911. How the hell was Titus O'Neil so entertaining on commentary last night, yet so annoying on this night? He's repeated, call the police, call 911, like five times in the last 15 seconds. Mm. I was in the higher 200 section throughout both nights of WrestleMania, and even I heard that chop so clearly. If it sounded brutal from where I was, I can only imagine what that must have felt like for Sheamus. We tap out McIntyre, however, with a Well, holy shit. Drew McIntyre kicks Gunther in the head, and the latter doesn't even budge and continues to cinch in the Boston Crab. He's like, kick me all you want. I will not let my championship slip away from me. And that's dedication. Look at Sheamus' chest busted open. Well, sure, Sheamus' chest is red and swollen from Gunther's chops, but he's not literally bleeding, so that's not exactly being busted open. SoFi Stadium view of the audience, number 8,162,023. Well, this is a, a new take on the... Just when you think this match couldn't get any more creative, here's Drew and Sheamus combining the 10 beats and knife edge chops to punish Gunther. Two, the way he's good. Oh! Sheamus probably kicked out because Titus O'Neil gave him the power he needed by saying that there was no way he could kick out of that. Gunther does not go up top. Except for the many times he has, not just during his time at the former NXT UK, but even in his main roster run. It's a shame that Sheamus relinquishes the Cloverleaf because how awesome would it have been for a Cloverleaf to be locked in on Gunther while Sheamus is also locked in in a sleeper hold by Drew McIntyre. Then the desperation to see who taps first would be through the glass roof. I get that both Drew and Sheamus are friends, but we're not seriously turning this into another Batista and Rey Mysterio situation from 2009, where one of them screams that they're supposed to be the other's friend, are we? Oh, we the title! Holy fucking shit! This is so much fun to watch. The energy from the crowd as Sheamus countered the Claymore kick into the bro kick and almost got the win. It's been ages since we've had an Intercontinental Championship match of this magnitude on the grand stage of WrestleMania. Awesome. 
referee honestly should have started counter the moment Sheamus put his hand on Drew's chest. As long as an appendage is over an opponent whose shoulders are down, that's a valid pinning position. Yet this referee waits until Sheamus is completely over him before he starts counting, which allows Gunther to intervene. This referee just cost Sheamus the one title he's never added to his career. Removing 15 cents for the absolute banger of a performance that Sheamus, Drew McIntyre, and Gunther put on for the Intercontinental Championship. This WrestleMania has indeed been one of the very best in a long time. That hits harder for my oh my god, seriously? The match is freaking over! Why are we still advertising this? I'm not drinking it for god's sake! Just making sure that the graphics are not spelled incorrectly this time around, just in case it's said that this match was for the AEW Women's Championship. Here is how these two icons came to me. Asuka simply won the Elimination Chamber match to earn a spot at Bianca Belair's title at WrestleMania, the end. Also speaking of, the build-up to this Raw Women's Championship match was even worse than Charlotte Flair vs. Rhea Ripley's feud. For one thing, Bianca Belair and Asuka had little to no interaction with each other, they teamed up one time, and the only bit of feuding these two women did was the time Asuka laughed and threw up in the ring to Bianca's disgust. And that's literally it. This is WrestleMania and your title feuds suck. Here are 10 sins. What is this, a discount John Cena from WrestleMania 25 entrance or something just without the endless amount of badass clones? Skippers, uh, I mean skip. Damn it, not a second night in a row where I said that. Also, the LED barricades during advertised matches could use the Snickers because they ain't themselves when they're hungry. <laughs> Quick question, why does Bianca Belair sometimes have the whip sound effect added to her entrance, yet for the other times it's omitted from the entrance? This entrance is just so much fun to watch. Bianca Belair shines again when it comes to kick-ass entrances at WrestleMania. At first glance here, you're just impressed with the amazing flexibility of this contortionist dancer. However, I gotta remove two sins. One for her impressive performance on the stage, and the other for the fact that she still went through with performing for Bianca Belair, despite her mother passing away earlier that morning. A talented, strong, and brave girl. Bianca Belair was so aggressive on Asuka early on in the match that she accidentally caused her opponent to lose some of her hair. Or was that part of Bianca's braid? Get caught up in the clutches of the wrong- Surprised that Asuka is not dizzy from all the times she was spinning around to whack Bianca Belair. And Asuka with a sliding knee. A sliding knee that never connected with either Bianca's face or the hands blocking her face, yet still caused her to get hit. Massive crowd here tonight. Well, we're not exactly in the tonight portion of the show since it's still bright sunlight outside, but go on. That's strange. Usually Bianca looks back, dares her opponent to come at her, and then backflips out of the way. Here she just lets Asuka come at her. Bianca trying new strategies at WrestleMania or something? This one doesn't seem to be working. Deeper into the ma this match we oh, the more le Won't lie, that was an impressive counter by Asuka to catch Bianca Belair the way she did, right into a version of the Asuka lock. Right now the Spanish commentators are likely saying, not again, when Bianca and Asuka got close to their table. Should have taken that Mandalorian deal. Up to the apron. One would think that we would see something cool out of this situation, but nope, it's just Bianca doing a little bit of gymnastics before failing to hit a suplex on Asuka. Asuka trying to fight out now, Asuka! Asuka is an idiot. Asuka, and look, like what we look saw at the power! Matchup. Yes, the power is impressive. However, Corey is acting like Bianca is deadlifting Asuka when you can clearly see the ladder jump up to get into position. Also, these two women have been outside the ring for about two minutes, and the referee was always counting. How have they not gotten counted out by now? The beauty of Belair has come from completing the submission. Now that was an impressive feat of strength by Bianca Belair, the way she got out of Asuka's submission. Where was Corey Graves being impressed during an actual impressive moment? Belair. The moment Bianca Belair starts to regain the offense and prepare her next move, the production crew thought it'd be a great idea to show a panoramic shot of SoFi Stadium and trolling with the audience in the nosebleeds by shutting off their screens. What a bunch of dicks. Again. More moments of the crowd booing when the screens were shut off and then cheering when they're turned back on. Wouldn't have this problem if the crew didn't keep malfunctioning everything. I really hope that Asuka chose to run the ropes on her own accord because Bianca's foot was out of her grasp before she could even start moving. Look at the power! Gotta love it when wrestlers hit superplexes with their opponents standing on the ring apron instead of the top rope. Such amazing power from the EST. I'm sorry, but no, Bianca Belair just took a knee to the face and she's not even phased by it. This late into the match, that is not believable whatsoever. Can she win it? The referee starts counting with Bianca's right shoulder is clearly seen off the canvas. Perhaps she's just tired of seeing Bianca as champion for a year and wanted Asuka to win. Favoritism from a referee is always a sin. I believe there might have been some incidental con If I were Asuka, I probably would have blasted the mist in Bianca's face the split second that she turned around, not long enough for my opponent to be aware of what I'm about to do. Well, since Michael Cole yelled Belair's going to tap, I'm just going to assume that Bianca Belair is not going to tap out. KO did what a performance! I mean, all the respect in the world to Bianca Belair, but this was honestly a terrible decision to have her win today. 
Asuka returns after some time off, brings back this badass character from her days in Japan, rebuilds herself up to bring back her momentum of domination, all for it to come crashing down at WrestleMania with her fifth consecutive loss. For someone who has the longest undefeated streak since debuting, Asuka is the opposite of The Undertaker at WrestleMania. Let's take you back to our main event last night. Because several of our matches tonight had short timelines, we gotta fill in the time by showing full recaps of last night's matches. We did not think this through. We still got about two hours left in the show, and I highly doubt that this main event is coming up next, unless it got randomly changed into a 60-minute Iron Man match at the last second. Now that I think about it, each night of WrestleMania 39 is nearly an exact replica of each other, there's a showcase match, a quick opening match, a mid-card title match, a women's title match, an undisputed title main event, and The Miz getting his ass handed to him by a big surprise. This is exactly like Home Alone and Home Alone 2. Also, I'm surprised that The Miz didn't try to make Snoop Dogg have a match instead of him. I know what actually ends up happening, but Miz should have at least tried to turn the tables on Snoop Dogg. Even with the exaggerated numbers, you mean to tell me that over a thousand people chose to attend the second night of WrestleMania compared to the first? Not expecting equal numbers here, but over a thousand more? Doubt it. You put me in a match wearing a $10,000 suit. So allow me to not put you in an impromptu match while I wear a $20,000 suit. I'm The Miz, and and I don't have an idea what I'm doing. My bad. <laughs> Gotta love Snoop Dogg. His defense is short, simple, and to the point. I feel bad for what inevitably happens to him, but gosh darn it, it's so fucking awesome to see Shane McMahon, even if his last appearance didn't sit well with Twitter marks. Shane O'Mac is always fun to watch. Go, get popping. Honestly, The Miz should have at least worn his ring gear underneath that suit just on the very case that Snoop Dogg was going to mess with him again. Don't worry, Shane. You're not the first McMahon to suddenly tear his quads on a very rare appearance in the ring. I suppose it runs in the family now. These are WWE. Much as this was a stupid situation, I gotta give props to Snoop Dogg for jumping into the ring and taking over for Shane McMahon. Well done on the improvising. You can clearly hear Jessica Carr yell at Snoop Dogg to hit the people's elbow so that we can get out of this mess. I know I'm supposed to be entertained here by Snoop Dogg, but that was by far the worst people's elbow I ever saw, and I've seen Eugene's attempts in the past. How about, um, Hell in a Cell? Michael Cole seems so cheerful and casually mentions the Hell in a Cell match as if that match was not some deadly structure that could end careers, unless he's probably used to the sad present day era of that match. Just when we are ready for Edge's amazing entrance, we're first going to show you a trailer to a movie that is sponsoring this match. True story, the fans booed the shit out of this film when it was showing. Thanks for ruining the freaking mood here. It has been six long years since WWE used the traditional colors of the Hell in a Cell structure. About time they brought it back because the Red McDonald's Playhouse looking structure was just not adding anything to it. Slayer. Freaking Slayer. One of my favorite bands of all time, and that line is coming from me personally, not the guy I'm crediting this sin to. But anyways, South of Heaven by Slayer for Brood Edge? Fuck yeah! Let's remove two sins for that. Edge realizes too late that he was in a position that the cameras would be unable to capture his pyrotechnics when he poses. What's better than seeing the demonic entity of Finn Balor? The demon embracing the purple colors of the Judgment Day, making it far more intimidating than the red lights. I love this combination. And this was all done. Discount John Morrison with a slow-mo. But never against the demon. Yeah, but Edge has been inside Hell in a Cell against the freaking Undertaker back in 2008. That alone is like facing three Finn Balor demons at once. The ring wasting little time. What the fuck? WWE decided to put the original colors back into the Hell in a Cell structure, but then chose to paint all the weapons red and purple? Couldn't have just left those with their usual colors too. Steel chair! Probably didn't work because the demon must be impervious to red steel chairs. That and it's holding Mace Windu's lightsaber, which has probably given it the strength of Sam L. Jackson. <laughs> I would be cringing in pain at Edge being speared against the cage, but I saw him readjust his face, so now I'm just cringing without the pain. Hating Finn Balor. What do you bet even Edge is confused at all the weapons being colored red and purple? Like, are we having a Hell in a Cell match or are we at a Star Wars convention here? We interrupt WrestleMania 39 to bring you Hell in a Cell 2017, conveniently the last time the original Hell in a Cell structure was present, and I was conveniently in attendance for that event too. One thing I always love about the demon is that deathly stare it gives its opponents even after consuming a lot of punishment. That thing is still frightening yet awesome at the same time all these years later. Even the fucking tables are multicolored? I might as well throw in 10 cents for these annoying color choices. Sacrifice the colors of the weapons just so we could get the original cell structure. Could you imagine how worse this would be if it was still the red cage? Nasty things in mind. Yeah, Edge probably should have done more damage on the demon before releasing it from the kendo stick trap. Look out! Oh! Little nod to Gangrel. 
I know that Gangrel did that move, but that was also the Education. You know, a move Edge has adopted himself throughout his entire career, Corey. Oddly enough, it was the comedic timing of the table pieces falling on Edge that hurt him more than actually getting kicked into it did. And now someone is definitely getting fired because they made sure to paint all but one of the steel chairs a different color. And with the regular colored chairs under the ring, I again ask why there were different colored ones. And now Edge! We've seen Edge win matches with- When the hell did Edge ever win a match with the edge of matic Name me one time he actually did. The Pioneer! Congratulations, Edge. You just caused the demon to spill practically all of its blood and forced the referee to call the match short. Finn Bal I get that the demon has been cut open, but damn it, this is a hell in a cell match. Blood should be expected to spill. And if the injury is way too deep, then simply let Edge know he has to finish it right now. Also, five minutes of nothing going on because of the demon's injury. I'm personally on board with the idea of Edge finishing the match so that the demon can get checked out. Edge is already back up. Well, I mean, he had like five whole minutes to rest up while the doctors closed up the demon's head. Are you seriously surprised? My stadium in Los Angeles. The crowd continues to boo the Pope's exorcist because they likely know it's going to do horrible in the box office. Just watch. Oh my, oh my God. goodness! Because of that laceration, seeing the demon take that execution from the top rope and the ladder looks scary and worrisome, and I freaking love it. Convenient platform so that a super coup de grace can happen is convenient. Calm down, Michael. It's not like he's at the top of the freaking cage about to jump through that table like Shane McMahon. From an incredible height. I wouldn't exactly call that an incredible height because the ropes allow the demon to jump higher in the air while a steel platform doesn't have that same luxury. Plus, it jumped from the same height as a regular coup de grace. Edge slays the demon the same way this whole thing got extremely personal. It all comes full circle tonight at WrestleMania 39. Even though the match had to be cut short, it still did a good job of being an entertaining and brutal Hell in a Cell match. Also, I'm not kidding, it takes over 20 freaking minutes before we actually start hyping up the main event. The next 20 minutes is a bunch of commercials, promos for Backlash, and next year's WrestleMania, the Hall of Fame class, more commercials, and the return of the freaking TurboTax advertisement! After having a bunch of non-pyro pyro yesterday, Rey Mysterio finally got his actual pyro back tonight. About time, and congrats on the Hall of Fame induction. Just one final check to make sure the graphics doesn't say Roman Reigns vs. The Rock. Nope, we're good, carry on. Also, Cody Rhodes' big build-up to this was him wanting to finish the story, which, if you think about it, technically means he intended on retiring from professional wrestling after this match. Because, unless he never does anything else after tonight, his story isn't finishing, and neither is the story of the Rhodes family that Dusty Rhodes started. Because it continues on through him. So what story is he trying to finish here? Aw, oh, damn it, I was facing the wrong way! Also, I know both these entrances are fun to watch, but 13 minutes of entrances for just two wrestlers. Let's be thankful it's not a fatal four-way also involving The Undertaker and Bray Wyatt, otherwise we'd up that to 30 minutes of entrances. If WWE was saving their pyro budget for Cody Rhodes' entrance here, they didn't exactly save a lot because we saw basically the same amount we would normally see on Raw, just a little bit bigger. You gotta admit it, Liberty Rhodes is already a badass by rejecting the air moth saying, I don't need to wear this shit, I'm a Rhodes. Brody Jr., negative one. So freaking awesome to see the late Luke Harper's son in attendance to watch Cody Rhodes compete. Very heartwarming to see, and now I got more tears in my eyes. I'm getting serious Bobby Roode vibes off seeing this piano-style entrance for Roman Reigns. That and the days of broken Matt Hardy. Regardless, it was still fun to see. One thing I gotta praise Roman Reigns for is being the first wrestler to defend the same world title reign at three consecutive WrestleMania events. If only Hulk Hogan defended his title at the first ever WrestleMania back in 1985, then Roman would have to do this another year to break the record, but here we are. Four men. Michael Cole making sure to take all the time in the world to mention those four names that held a championship longer than Roman Reigns. What makes it more awkward is we have heard these same four names almost every pay-per-view since Roman surpassed Brock Lesnar's 500-day reign. Cody tried to do something his father was never able to accomplish. Well, to be fair, the one championship Cody Rhodes has been trying to win that his father never did was the WWE Championship. The Universal Championship didn't exist until one year after Dusty Rhodes passed away. Also, I get that Roman Reigns is a double world champion here, and holding two titles sounds more exciting than just one, but I really think Cody should be trying to win just the WWE Championship here as he's trying to finish the story, something the Universal title has nothing to do with. Fuck. Turbo. Tax. We exist. Oh, it's momentarily. Roman Reigns takes one punch from Cody Rhodes and that's enough to send him retreating to the outside. Like, brah, you conquered bigger threats than Cody. How are you running away from him? <laughs> Roman Reigns be like, no, no, let's not talk here. Let's move closer to the fans so they can hear our private conversation and alert Cody Rhodes about our strategy. 
Paul Heyman's sexual fantasies. To take him to that next. The referee gives Roman a four count, then conveniently starts yelling instead of continuing to five when Roman ignores him. I also don't want the match to end in a disqualification, but could we at least not make the referee insult our intelligence? Oh, was sick. Oh, Rhodes wanted a disaster kick. Actually, judging by the way Cody Rhodes leaped into the air, he wasn't trying to hit a disaster kick at all. Looked more like he wanted to try a Hurricane Rana on Roman Reigns, who just ended up catching him by convenience. He ended up being a disaster, all right. Oh, come on, man. It was a good start to this main event match, and you had to ruin it with a bad pun. Roman Reigns remains ready. So, what you're saying is Roman Reigns would not have to work out or get prepared mentally because he would always remain ready to compete? I don't think that's how the physical body works, Corey. Way too overdramatic here. You know, Cody's never faced Reigns one-on-one. -on -one. True, but that doesn't mean Cody has no idea how to face or even defeat Roman Reigns, having done that in 2013 with Goldust. Wasn't one-on-one, -on -one, but a win is still a win. He at least knows how to get it done. Oh, no. That would look like it hurts, but since Roman is throwing Cody up the ramp instead of down the ramp, there's less airtime, thus less impact. Also, Roman figures that he can spend as much time as possible on the outside due to the fact that the referee traditional rules and all will allow it. Cody Rhodes, while recovering from the attack, took a moment to bring back his dashing days by admiring his reflection on the ramp. <laughs> Cody Rhodes apparently lost his peripheral vision because how the hell did he not see Sola Sokoa reach underneath the ring to pull out a weapon? I, stadium, absolutely feel I know that Sola Sokoa eventually gets caught and ejected from ringside, but these non-stop interferences throughout the whole match is getting a bit much and very overkill. Even though Roman Reigns has targeted the American announce table, the Spanish commentators have already fled the scene, even despite their table being safe from harm. For the time being, at least. I think Reigns is- Whoops, never mind, spoke too soon. My bad. I'm just saying, because of how slow Roman Reigns has been dismantling the tables and preparing Cody's demise, both wrestlers have been outside the ring for longer than a 50 count, and I don't even think the referee has reached the 4 count yet. He wants to continue- Ow, my dashing hands! Roman Rones take- Roman Rones? Wait, there's a brand new wrestler joining the company called Roman Rones? Whoever that guy is, he just might be the one destined to crush Roman Reigns. Cody's, Cody's got a chance! I mean, sure, Cody has a chance, but he's gotta deadlift Roman's unconscious body and put him back at the ring first. Come on, Cody! Michael Cole getting a little too annoying with the cheerleading. It worked with Dominic Mysterio because you hated his guts, and for Pat McAfee because he's your best friend, but not once did Michael ever join up Cody's side. Oh! Nice callback to his days in the legacy, the fake out clothesline usually executed by Ted DiBiase Jr. and the scoop slam usually executed by Randy Orton. Gotta love the shoutouts to when Cody Rhodes really kickstarted his WWE career. This was his chance! It's not like the Cody Cutter was his finishing move or anything, plus he never once hit a crossroads yet. Michael Cole was quick to think that this was Cody's chance to become the Universal Champion and it failed miserably. Don't give up just yet, dude. Solo with that! Finally! About time the referee actually uses his ears and his brain instead of just his eyes. Cody is suddenly down after a convenient whipping noise was her, so let's eject Solo Sokoa from ringside. The roar of the crowd when he got ejected was amazing. Roman Reigns is alone! I mean, there's still Paul Heyman who could still get involved. So until the entire bloodline is dissected one after the other, Roman Reigns will never be alone. In Harry Potter terms, the bloodline is Roman's horcruxes, and you can't beat him until all of them have been destroyed. Even if that initial crossroads did not give Cody the victory, that was one of the most picture-perfect crossroads executions I've ever seen. Perfect turning, and best of all, no dumb overreacting like a tree on the landing. You're an Auggie on the rock bottom! No, you were right the first time you said you're an Auggie because that was not how to execute the rock bottom. Roman would have had to fall with Cody in that exchange. I just love the wide-eyed expressions on Paul Heyman's face practically every time Roman Reigns is in danger of losing his championships. Something about it is always so funny. When the moment finally happens for Roman to lose, make sure to get a full up-close shot of Paul's reaction. That's a reaction we are required to see. Oh! Cody's alive! Roman Reigns is in shock and nearly crying because Cody Rhodes kicked out of the Superman Punch, despite the fact that Roman almost never wins a match with the Superman Punch. Ever thought to go for a spear or something? You know, the one move you have yet to hit in this match so far. Shift the momentum, reverse the- Um, I'm pretty sure Roman Reigns just tapped out there. His intention was likely to claw his way around, but the positioning his hand was in, I'm sure that was a submission. An unintentional one, but a submission nonetheless. That should still count if you think about it. And yet, it somehow doesn't. Here are five sins. <laughs> Talking to yourself, probably learned that from our truth and little Jimmy.
An excellent way for Roman Reigns to hit the spear and an amazing kick out from Cody Rhodes, hanging in there with all that he's got. Instead of walking around, standing around, and signaling around, Roman Reigns should really be trying to finish off Cody Rhodes. I would have lifted up Cody's exhausted body and hit another spear without underestimating his abilities. That reaction when Cody Rhodes escaped from the guillotine chokehold. Holy shit, what a moment. Even in attendance, I was shocked beyond belief because nobody ever escaped that hold. You absolutely love to see it. Rival Chief allowed Ro Figured it was only a matter of time before that was inevitably going to happen. It's a Roman Reigns match in the main event of WrestleMania after all. About freaking time that the Usos getting involved got thwarted to a degree like this. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn returning to brawl with the Usos after last night's epic main event was awesome. Really showed that anything can happen now. Cody's gonna do it! You just know Cody's not going to do it because Michael Cole is repeating that, and it's been a while since Roman took the stunner and halufa kick combination. Solo! Spare! <sighs> you know, I would have been just fine with Roman Reigns retaining the Undisputed Universal Championship if we didn't literally repeat the exact way he won a clash at the castle against Drew McIntyre. Seriously, this is WrestleMania. At least have Roman retain it some other bullshit way instead of the same bullshit way. This deserves a hundred thousand sins for a really bad copy-paste ending. Though, and I know a lot of people are going to hate this, but I believe Roman being the one to win this match was perfect. It benefits Cody's story more than the opposite result ever could. He was all happy-go-lucky throughout the road to WrestleMania, with everything put on easy mode. After all, Dusty Rhodes failed the first time, so it makes sense for Cody to be in the same position. Adds into the determination to get back up when his father didn't in the same scenario.